Well, ordinarily, this is where the music will be playing, but we're going to start cold today. Hi, uh, welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the Physicians Committee. I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. Appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube. Coming up, flavanols. What are they and why are they important? Well, a new study is showing that when it comes to high blood pressure, these flavanols, they may just be your best friend. To discuss and give some ideas on where you can find them, what foods are rich in them, we're going to speak with dietitian Lee Crosby. Lee Crosby, ordinarily the fiber queen today, you will be the flavanol queen. So thanks for taking the time. <laughs> and we're also going to be opening up the doctor's mailbag, Dr. Vanita Rahman. She is here making a house call with us today, teaming up with Lee to answer your health and nutrition questions. Dr. Rahman, appreciate you being here. So if you have a question for either Lee or Dr. Rahman, go ahead, drop that in the comment section now or the chat box, or you can even tweet them to us using the hashtag exam room live. We're going to go ahead and open up that doctor's mailbag in just a little bit. But first, let's get caught up on the latest happenings. Here are your health headlines for Thursday, October 22nd, 2020. And the country remains locked in the latest wave of coronavirus cases. Nearly 63,000 new infections being reported Wednesday, along with more than 1,100 deaths the most on any single day in more than a month. Cases are increasing now in three quarters of the country and in North Dakota, infection rates are more than five times higher than the national average. South Dakota, not far behind. Meanwhile, the CDC now revising guidance for who is considered to be at risk for becoming infected. In an update that may have major effects on businesses and schools and other gathering places, the agency now defines close contact as having spent a total of 15 minutes with an infected individual over the span of 24 hours. Previous guidance said that that 15 minutes needed to be in consecutive minutes. The agency also says the revised guidance continues to de demonstrate the importance of mask wearing to reduce the risk of transmission. All right, how about some nutrition news? Eating soy may lower your risk of dementia. A new study finds that a compound produced when certain people eat the legume can significantly reduce the amount of white matter lesions within the brain. That's a reduction of up to 50%. But there is a catch here. The co compound in question, equal, is only created when gut bacteria conditions are just right. And researchers in the study say that was only in about 40 to 70% of Japanese adults. And here in America, just 20 to 30% of Americans have this. But the results, they say, are powerful when equal is present. It has previously been shown to lower the risk of heart disease. And finally, if you want to lower your blood pressure, eating higher amounts of flavanols may help. In a study of more than 25,000 people, UK researchers say people who consumed the most food and drinks that were loaded with flavanols had significantly lower blood pressure. The study finds the reduction is on par with the popular Mediterranean and DASH diets currently prescribed for hypertensive patients. All right, so let's talk flavanols, shall we? What are they? What foods have them? And why do they matter? For that, we turn to the flavanol queen, dietitian Lee Crosby. Uh, Lee, thanks so very much for joining us. Flavanol, two things. One, that's a fun word to say. Uh, it is, two, right? <laughs> <laughs> what foods have them? We saw green tea on the screen, so I'm imagining that's going to be one of them. Green tea, absolutely. It's actually a bunch of my favorite foods. So green tea, get ready, cocoa products. Yay. Berries. Berries are our top food for this. Grapes and apples. Okay. Green tea, berries, grapes, apples. I'm kind of getting the sense that you want foods that have some color to them. So that is a fun thing. Right. So what there are a couple of different kinds of these flavanols. Um, there are these proanthocyanidins. I think I got the pronunciation on that right. And they they give some like berries in particular, but also things like even like pomegranates and plums, some of the astringency that you have, but they also oftentimes contribute to that bright color. So again, just another reason to eat those colorful, in this case, fruits. All right. All right. I'm, I'm on board with that. I think I read in one of the studies, some leafy greens may have them to a lesser extent as well. Is that something that you've heard as well? Um, I haven't read that, but I wouldn't be surprised. I do know that fruits across the board all have at least 
I want to say all, because I'm sure there's someone to be like, wait, there's a fruit <laughs> that doesn't. <laughs> but the vast majority of fruits, shall we say, uh, um, are are decent sources. But again, those berries and anything you can almost think of that has that like a fruit that has that little bit of an astringency to it. So again, like a pomegranate or a persimmon, some of the berries, cranberries are actually pretty loaded with these. Um, and actually blueberries, not as astringent, but are a really great source in general. So um, yeah, absolutely. Uh I'm a big fan of cranberry. You know, it is cranberry season with it becoming it fall, you know? So uh, break out the cranberries and get your flavin all fixed. Um, real quick, uh, Lee, while I've got you here, I wanted to check in with you about the Let's Beat Breast Cancer campaign. I know that you and Dr. Christy Funk, the two of you are really spearheading this for us this year. And how are things going right now? How, how is the campaign going? They are actually going great. So we have gotten all kinds of coverage. Um, Dr. Funk has been on Good Morning America. She was also on the Dr. Oz show. So there's just been a lot of great coverage and all kinds of, she did a whole radio and podcast sort of blast. She's been on a bunch of other different shows. I was on Good Morning Washington, <laughs> very <laughs> exciting. Um, but we've gotten some really great coverage, lots of people coming to the website and taking the pledge. So if you haven't yet taken the pledge and you wanna sort of like up your cancer smacking skills a little bit, now is the time because you can hop online at letsbeatbreastcancer.org. Just click, there's a big pink thing at the top that says take the free pledge. Click on that. What you're gonna do is just fill in your name and email address and what you will do, what you get when you do that is you get a free e-cookbook, you get um, a four different emails, plus one the day you sign up, that give you tips and recipes and all kinds of inspiration for making this happen. And, and this being following the four Let's Beat Breast Cancer steps in terms of choosing plant-based foods, getting active, reducing or eliminating alcohol consumption, and maintaining a healthy weight. And then I think the coolest thing is that besides breast health, that's the very coolest thing, is that you'll be entered to win one of three plant-powered grand prize packs. So if you haven't already, please jump over to letsbeatbreastcancer.org, click the button and take that pledge. Yeah, those grand prize packs are, are very cool. Um, and, and I will say step one is eating that plant-based diet, choosing the plant-based foods. I would imagine, as with the theme of the day, that if you do that naturally, you're going to have a diet that's rich in flavanols. You will have a diet that's rich in flavanols. And I want to circle back to the fall fruits because you're right. I was looking at this and I have on my list persimmon, pomegranate. We've got grapes. Oh, wait, there was one more. Oh, and I can't think of it. Um, but anyways, you're getting a lot of your fall fruits in this flavanol category. So, you know, enjoy apples. Thank you. There we go. Yes. Uh oh, oh, it is apple <laughs> season. I've been enjoying it. I need to go eat my apples. apples. Yes. I know, for real. Uh, okay. Uh, well, Lee Crosby, thank you very much. And as she said, we are continuing the Let's Beat Breast Cancer campaign throughout the month of October. And I also want to say thank you to Rip Esselstyn and the folks over at Engine 2 for their support this year. Because, you know, one out of every eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer during their lifetime. But you can, in fact, lower your risk right now by taking that pledge that Lee was talking about over at Let's Beat Breast Cancer. Dot org. Head there, learn more about those four steps, get entered to win that grand plant powered prize pack, and you can also receive that free e cookbook. Lots of good over there at letsbeatbreastcancer.org. Before we open up the doctor's mailbag and move on, I wanted to bring Dr. Vanita Rahman on as well to talk a little bit more about one of those other steps that were mentioned, and that is getting to and maintaining a healthy weight. So, Dr. Rahman, you are in fact a weight loss expert. You run all of our great weight loss programs here at the Physicians Committee. And I think in terms of breast cancer, risk, obesity is something that often goes overlooked. So can you give us some tips really quickly on how a woman who is interested in losing weight and lowering that risk of breast cancer, some tips on how she might want to get going with that? I think you're muted, Dr. Rahman. That's all right. It happens to the best of us. There oh, we go. Thank you. Hello. You would think I'd know that by now. Um, <laughs> but a uh, really great point about obesity and the risk for breast cancer. We know that research shows that women who are obese have a much higher rate of postmenopausal breast cancer. So it's really important to maintain a healthy weight for a variety of reasons, including breast cancer reduction. Now, what are some things that women can do to maintain a healthy weight? Well, first and foremost, uh, eating a healthy diet and something that we talk about eating a low fat, 
plant-based diet is key. Uh, and it's really important to be specific about that. Many people know plant-based diets are healthier, but within plant-based diets, we really want to keep it low fat with lots of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. And then getting regular exercise is important. Uh, we know exercise has a lot of benefits, but probably uh, the most important thing really here is the diet. So I can't emphasize that enough because we can't outdo our diet with exercise, no matter how much we exercise. And then getting adequate sleep, stress reduction and management are important because when we don't sleep, when we don't manage our stress, it makes it that much harder to eat well and take care of ourselves. That's such a great point that you can't outrun your diet. That's uh, such a mistake so many people make. I made that so many times. You know, you think that you lose weight. The first thing you do is go outside and go for a walk, and, and that's going to get you covered. That's going to undo all of your wrongdoings at the table. But really, you need to, you know, flip those priorities a little bit and put diet first before you go out there, and then everything should start to fall in place for you a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and let's be clear, exercise is super important. It has tremendous health benefit, but it cannot undo our diet. So really important to eat well as, as we're doing this. All right. Well, I'm sure that we have a lot of questions now about eating well. So let's go ahead and open up that doctor's mailbag. If you have a question for Lee Crosby, or if you have a question for Dr. Rahman, let's go ahead and post that in the comment section. Now, again, you can also tweet that to us using the hashtag exam room live. And Lee, I want to start with you because we've been talking about fruit and flavanol. Well, how about fruit and diabetes? We have a question here gets asked a lot, but it's always worth answering. This is a question from Kirti. She wants to know, does eating fruits such as mango cause diabetes? I am so happy to answer this question. I feel like the fruit people, I don't know if there's like a fruit board, but <laughs> they should come see me because I'm a huge fan of fruit and that includes for diabetes. And I know for a lot of people, that's a bit jarring to hear because you think, oh, well, fruit has sugar in it. And we know that sugar, high blood sugar is a problem with diabetes. So you shouldn't have fruit, right? And the answer is no, not right. The sugar in fruit, again, you're not just knocking it back like a soda. What you're having it with, it's packaged with all kinds of great stuff, right? You're getting fiber, you're getting minerals, you're getting potassium and vitamin C and all these protective phytochemicals like flavanols that we talked about, antioxidants, they're anti-inflammatory, they all promote health and multiple studies have shown either no effect or more often a beneficial effect on blood sugar levels and overall health and just really quick, there was a study done of more than half a million people in China. And what they found is that people who ate fresh fruit every day, so the best snack, also good dessert, uh, were 12% likely, less likely to get type two diabetes in the first place. And then, but wait, if people already had diabetes and you think, oh, well, they'd be the ones who'd be at risk, they were actually slightly less likely to die or get complications of diabetes, like eye problems or diabetic um, you know, retinopathy, nephropathy during the study if they were eating more fruit. So please, when it comes to diabetes, whether you wanna reduce your risk or have better outcomes, please eat lots and lots of those colorful fruits. Dr. Rahman, sticking with diabetes here, this is a question that comes to us from eDog. Uh, he wants to know regarding type two diabetes, what is the mechanism that causes the body to produce excess insulin? Yeah. So let's, for those people who may not know, when we talk about diabetes, we're talking about a condition where our blood sugar is high. And there are two basic types of diabetes, type one, that's, uh, and then type two. In type one, uh, our insulin stop, our, our pancreas stop producing insulin. We think it's an autoimmune condition where there's inflammation in the pancreas, they produce less and less insulin, and then eventually the person who has this condition will need lifelong insulin. And that accounts for about 10% of diabetes. It's usually seen in young children. Type two diabetes accounts for 90% of diabetes that we see. It's usually a disease that occurs in middle age, but now we're seeing it at younger and younger ages, even in children. And in type two diabetes, the pancreas are still capable of producing insulin, but our body becomes resistant to it. So even though we have insulin, it just isn't as effective anymore. And the reason we become resistant to it is because uh, of our diet. When our diet is high in fat, our cells don't take the insulin as in as easily and insulin isn't able to do its job. And so the pancreas 
in response will produce more and more insulin to overcome that. And uh, with time, that response just kind of fails and we end up with high blood sugars. So it's really our high fat diet that seems to play a key role in insulin resistance, which causes the pancreas to compensate by making more insulin. All right, Lee, coming to you for a Flavanol follow-up. This one comes to us from Richard at 1209. Wants to know, what is the best cocoa for Flavanols? I have raw cacao nibs every day. I think raw cacao nibs, the, the short answer is I don't have a specific in terms of this particular kind. Raw cacao nibs should be a good source, um, particularly because you're right, since they haven't been roasted, you would expect that there wouldn't be any degradation of those flavanol uh, compounds. They do actually make, there are some cocos on the market that are sort of marketed as like half cocoa powder, half high, you know, uh, flavanol and other sort of you know, cocoa goodness <laughs> for the lack of a scientific term, but for they're higher in flavonoids and that whole sort of compound family of compounds of which flavanols are just one. So they do have their, those are on the market. So you can look those up, but as a general rule, I think a raw cacao nib would be a fine way to get it. You'd want to just be a little careful with those because they can be higher in fat. So just, you know, monitor the amounts that you're using. But man, if you were to have a berry smoothie and chuck some raw cacao nibs in there and maybe a little bit of green tea or matcha, you'd be covered, sleeping all, <laughs> all the way. I, I think uh, as, as long as we're talking about cocoa, cacao, and chocolate, we should really kind of draw a distinction here between raw cacao nibs and a white chocolate Hershey's bar because they are not even remotely in the same ballpark. No, you got it. First off, again, we're talking pigments. If you want to get the flavanols, it has to be, you got to have some color in there. So if, if, if you have this anemic white chocolate bar, there's really what that is, is you can think of it as a white sort of cocoa butter bar. So if you want to have a butter bar, cocoa butter, but still that's just sugar and the fat pulled out of the cocoa, that's what you're going to get with a white chocolate bar. And any of the bar chocolates, frankly, um, what they do is they mix cocoa with extra fat typically saturated fat. That's what makes it a bar, you know, you knock on it, you can hit that puppy on the table. That's what makes it have that hard, you know, feel. So unless you want to have that saturated fat also kind of spackled in your arteries, which I personally don't, uh, better to stick to cocoa powder or at the very, or you could do a cocoa nib where it's in the whole form, the way you get it. So both of those are better options by far than a chocolate bar, even a dark chocolate bar, which while yes, it's certainly better health-wise than a milk chocolate bar, it's still not a great option overall. All right, Dr. Ramon, coming to you. Question from Vmore at 1217 says, I've been vegan for three and a half months. My glucose level is now normal, but my blood pressure is still a little elevated. Do you have any advice? Yeah, well, first of all, congratulations uh, for staying vegan for three and a half months. And, and clearly, it's made an, a difference in your blood glucose levels, which is wonderful. As far as blood pressure, so we know plant based foods can help lower our blood pressure. But um, we also need to understand which plant based foods. When we're talking about blood pressure, we have to be really mindful of the amount of sodium in our diet, not salt per se, but the sodium. Salt is just one component of sodium. And over 75% of the sodium in our diet comes from processed food or restaurant food. And the more sodium we consume, the higher our blood pressure goes. So if you are trying to reduce your blood pressure, I would recommend really reading those nutrition labels and seeing how much sodium is in each serving. You want to limit your daily sodium intake to 1,500 milligrams a day. And a rule of thumb that I love for this is if the serving size has more sodium than calories, then put it back. You want to get food that has less sodium than calories in it, and that really helps a lot. So watching the sodium is going to be key. Also getting plenty of potassium in the form of fruits, vegetables, legumes and grains that are just packed with it, but especially fruits that we've been talking about today, because potassium helps reduce it. Dr. Ramon, I want to stick with you. We have a great question here from Dinah at 1220. She uh, wants to know, can having too much overt fats in the diet, such as avocado and tofu nuts and seeds, cause insulin resistance, even among someone who's eating a whole food plant-based diet? So healthy fats, can you still have too much of it? Yeah, I, I think so. Definitely. Uh, so within, we know that animal foods are just naturally high in fat. 
And most plant-based foods like fruits, nuts, uh, uh, fruits, vegetables, legumes, grains are pretty low in fat. But certain plant-based foods like avocados, nuts, seeds, they're about 70% fat. So they're pretty high. So if you have prediabetes or diabetes, or you're trying to lower your body weight, I do recommend uh, limiting the amounts of these high fat foods. Uh, and now tofu is interesting. It's about 50% fat. So it's a lot lower. I don't think that causes as much problem usually because it's a little bit hard to overeat tofu. It's so hearty, whereas things like nuts, seeds, avocados, it's much easier to overconsume them. All right, Lee, coming back to you for this one. First of all, Marco uh, wants to say thank you for the vegan on a budget episode that we did uh, last year or the year before. He said that he got a lot of enjoyment out of that. Oh, um, but that's one of my favorite topics. You're welcome, Marco. <laughs> I know when we went downstairs to the grocery store and loaded oh, up our a a grocery yeah. cart, I yep. feed a whole, you know, two people for an like entire week for like something. 40 yeah. bucks. Yeah, it yeah. was insane. Uh, all right. Question from Stephanie wants to know about FODMAP diets. Uh, what is your opinion on low FODMAP diets for IBS? She writes that my husband is on it, but that also eliminates many veggies that are nutritious as well, such as garlic and onions. Excellent question. So low FODMAP diets are a, a, a proven treatment strategy when it comes to reducing IBS symptoms. However, there are a couple of things. One, they are not meant for long term. So FODMAP diets you eliminate and then you reintroduce in increasing amounts and by different groups of FODMAPs to see which ones the person is or is not sensitive to. Some people will be sensitive to one type of FODMAP, some to multiples. So at the beginning of the diet, you're gonna wipe out, you're right, a lot of healthy foods are gonna go to the wayside, but it's you're not supposed to stay there. That's not a place where you live, where you hang out. You then, and preferably this is actually where it makes sense to work with a registered dietitian because they can take you all the way through this process because what happens to a lot of people, they go it on their own, they wipe out all these high FODMAP foods, which are actually really good for you. I hate to say this, but those high FODMAP is also a, a way to say high prebiotic fiber because those prebiotic fibers that feed the good bugs are oftentimes FODMAPs. So that what they'll do is they'll just get stuck. They'll feel better doing low FODMAP and they'll never start challenging to see which of those groups of FODMAPs they can tolerate and how much. And so they actually just get stuck eating this sort of nutritionally depleted diet. So if you're in that category, please, please go find a registered dietitian, preferably one who has a specialty in plant-based nutrition to help you get as many, as much, and as many different kinds of those FODMAPs back in your diet as you can tolerate, because you're right. I mean, we know things like garlic and onions and apples, they're high in FODMAPs, but they're also incredibly good for you. So please go, go, go find a dietitian and make sure that you can work those back in as much as you can. Dr. Rahman, coming to you, this is a question from Gail. She wants to know, does the plaque that is already in your arteries disappear with a whole food plant-based SOS diet? Yeah, it's a really important question. We, we believe it can diminish. So uh, this is based on research that doctors Dean Ornish and doctors call uh, and Dr. Caldwell Esselstein did. And what they saw in their research studies is that people who followed a low-fat whole food plant-based diet when they had an angiogram before and after, there was regression of the plaques. So we believe it can, uh, but it's hard to know uh, to what extent and if it'll be the same for everybody. But we know based on their research, the best thing we can do to minimize our risk of heart disease or cardiovascular disease is to eat a whole food plant-based diet. All right, we have time for a few more questions, so go ahead and keep on posting yours in the comments section. Now we're going to try to sneak as many in as we possibly can. Uh, Dr. Rahman, I want to stick with you here. Question from Cassidy wants to know, should I avoid oil and processed foods on a whole food plant-based diet, or are they okay to eat? That question came in at 1224 this afternoon. Yeah, really important question there you're asking. It is best to avoid oil. Uh, you know, for so long, oils have been commonly used in cooking, and especially olive oil has been touted as a health food. Well, they really aren't healthy for us. Oil is nothing but 100% fat. It doesn't provide any essential nutrients for us that we can't get in better ways from more healthier foods, uh, especially if you're trying to lower your blood sugar or reduce your body weight. It's really important to avoid oil. And for everyone, uh, avoiding oil... Um, 
is important because we know oil, including olive oil, impairs our vascular function. So uh, I would recommend that. And then same thing with processed foods. You know, processed food for those uh, who are wondering is loosely defined as food that's been processed from its original form by the food industry and then sold to us, whether it's frozen, canned, or in a jar. A and the problem with processed food is it tends to be, not always, but it usually tends to be high in fat, high in sodium, high in calories. So uh, it's best to avoid it if you can, but it also depends on the food. And that's where it's really important to read the ingredients, look at that nutrition label, look at how much fat there is, look at how much sodium there is, look at the caloric density before making that decision. Lee, next question comes to us from Jana. She wants to know, do you recommend soaking nuts overnight before eating them to activate them for better absorption? What do you think, Lee? Okay, so I'm guessing that the, the what we're actually asking here is, so nuts contain something called phytates, and they are sort of one of the ways that the nut kind of is sort of quiet and quiescent in its little cute little shell there until it's time to germinate. And what's the signal that it's time to germinate is water. And what that does in terms of absorption is it actually starts to make the minerals in that seed, which are getting ready to go off and do their little seed germinating job. In this case, the nut is the seed. Um, it makes them more bioavailable, a little bit more absorbable. Now, interestingly, phytates then so you would think okay we're just going to soak soak the nuts that's going to be great and you can do that and it does have the advantage of making the minerals in the nuts a little more absorbable things like iron and magnesium um but there actually are some health benefits to phytates as well so they're they're linked with some you know lower risks of chronic diseases so my answer is if you have time and the desire, go ahead and do that. If you're gonna leave them out for more than a couple of hours, I would go ahead and soak them in the fridge just for food safety purposes. Um, and again, soaking really is only particularly helpful um, with raw nuts, not so much as I understand it with ones that are already roasted. Um, so if you wanna soak them, great. They're certainly easier to work with in a blender. If you wanna make a dressing or something that's creamy and you don't have a high power blender, just soak those cashews, for example, first. Um, but if you wanna eat them raw, that's fine too. All right. And sticking with you, here is your final question for the day. It all goes back to the whole chocolate and cacao thing. This one is from Mona. She says, I've replaced cacao with carob. Was that a good decision, Lee? I think I think it's a fine decision. Um, there are a couple. Th so like every like so many things in life, there are good things and bad things, even about cocoa. So cocoa and chocolate does contain some stimulants. That's part of the reason that it feels so good to eat it. <laughs> it contains some caffeine. It also contains theobromine, which is sort of in that same family, not quite as strong of a stimulant. Um, and, you know, th there are lots of health benefits of chocolate, the sort of stimulant side of things, probably less so. So you're getting away from that with a carob and you're still getting lots of fiber and I'm not as familiar in terms of like the phytonutrient profile of carob, but given that it's basically a whole plant food, I'm guessing it's going to be pretty good. So do I think that's an issue? No. And if you want to get more of those flavanols, just have some berries, have some grapes, enjoy an apple with lunch or with breakfast if you're out on the West Coast. Um, but yeah, I think that's a fine swap to make. And Dr. Rahman, the final, final question of the day comes to you. This one from Suzanne. She is asking, can you please talk about the way that diet and osteoporosis are connected? Yeah, so such an important topic. Osteoporosis is a disease of the bone where the bones lose their bone density. They become more brittle, more prone to fracturing. And for years, women were told, to make sure they consume adequate dairy products so that they can deposit calcium in their bones and strengthen their bones. Well, guess what? That The opposite is actually true. Uh, in countries where dairy is consumed more, we see higher rates of osteoporosis and related fractures. So while dairy products may contain calcium, it's not benefiting our bones. And one of the best things we can do to protect our bones and strengthen them is to eat a whole food plant-based diet. And we can get plenty of calcium from green leafy vegetables, from beans and legumes, and from fortified milk, such as soy milk or almond milk. They'll often have calcium added to them. And tofu is a great source of calcium. So 
Um, in terms of diet, a whole food plant-based diet is the best way to go. And then there are other things that are important, such as getting regular exercise, especially weight-bearing exercise, such as walking. People may not be aware that simple walking is a weight-bearing exercise. When we walk, our skeleton has to support our body weight, and that strengthens our bones. So walking or strength training with Pilates or weightlifting, running, these are all great options. All right, you guys, my exam roomies, you were asking some great questions today. So uh, Dr. Rahman, Lee Crosby, thank you both very much for your time and, and fielding them and prescribing some answers, really clearing up some nutrition confusion for us today. Thank you both uh, very much. And if we did not get to your question on the show today, have no fear. We will save it and we will do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. So go ahead, keep on posting that in the chat box or in the comment section or tweet them to us using the hashtag exam room live. And don't forget, you can also schedule a telemedicine appointment to visit with Dr. Rahman or Lee at the Barnard Medical Center. For that, all you need to do is visit barnardmedical.org or pick up the phone and call 202-527-7500. Telemedicine appointments are available now in more than a quarter of the country. You can find a full list of states of where services are available at barnardmedical.org. And yes, insurance is accepted. All right, out today, a brand new episode of the Exam Room Podcast's that uh, it really asks an important question. What do you want your legacy to be? I'm joined by Allison Mahoney, who is a woman who met her husband, Greg, in about the last place that you would ever think that two future devout vegans would be. But nonetheless, there they were in a whirlwind romance ensued. Allison on the show shares their heartwarming story and how she's been able to carry on the important work that they began to support animals and promote a plant-based diet and lifestyle following Greg's passing. And she's done this through the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund. So then on the show, we ask, what do you, you who's watching this right now, what do you want your legacy to be? And we show you how you can turn that endless compassion that you already have into more than just an idea. We show you how to make that a reality. You can find out all about this and legacy giving. It's available now on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Look for the Exam Room Podcast by the Physicians Committee. Hit that subscribe button if you'd be so kind. Also, leave a five-star rating. All right, coming up on the show tomorrow, more of your questions and fielding the answers this go around, prescribing them, raising our nutrition IQs will be the one and only Dr. Neil Barnard. So go ahead, post your questions in early right now. You know it, chat box, comment section, tweet them to us. Either way, just get them in and we will be doing a full show with nutrition Q&A with Dr. Barnard beginning at noon Eastern tomorrow, right back here on Facebook and on YouTube. I want to say thank you one more time to Dr. Vernita Rahman and the Flavanol slash Fiber Queen dietitian Lee Crosby for joining us today. And to you as well for watching. Appreciate you being here, my exam roomie. And a big debt of gratitude to the crew behind the scenes that makes this show possible. Thank you guys for all of your hard work. On behalf of everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. And until then, stay safe, take a stand, and keep it plant-based. <laughs>